Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We will start shortly. Before we begin our webinars today, we have a few housekeeping rules to make. Kindly mute yourself throughout the webinar. If you have any questions to our speakers, feel free to type your questions into the chat box. Alternatively, you can use the raise hand function and unmute yourself during the Q&A session. Okay, hello and good afternoon, everyone. So on behalf of the organizing committee, it's my pleasure to welcome you here in this afternoon to our first webinar organized by Monash Industry Palm Oil Education and Research Platform, Nepal. My name is Michelle, together with me, Dr. Yasoda, who will be moderating today's session. So at this time, I would like to invite Professor Chan Eng Sing, who is the director of Nepal, to give his opening remarks. Let's welcome Prof. Chan. Uh, okay, so uh, thanks, uh, Michelle. Uh, so first of all, on behalf of NIPO, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our first uh, webinar series. And a special thanks to our two, two speakers uh, today who will be sharing their work. Uh, Dr. Li Ying from uh, School of Science, uh, Monash University of Malaysia, and uh, Mr. Brian C from uh, Photo Gaia, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, since I think we have uh, many participants uh, from outside uh, Monash today, so I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, give uh, you a brief introduction uh, about NIPO. So I'm Chan, so I'm, I'm, I'm from Chemical Engineering, and I'm currently the Director of uh, NIPO. And uh, Dr. Pushpa Mala from School of Science uh, is the Deputy Director of uh, NIPO. So uh, just in case, if you're not aware, uh, uh, about uh, Monash. So Monash is an uh, Australian-based uh, uh, university and we are based in Clayton near uh, Melbourne. Uh, we have campuses uh, all over the world, including Malaysia, China, uh, Italy, uh, India, UK, and most recently we have set up a campus in uh, Jakarta as well, uh, Indonesia. And the Malaysia campus is the largest uh, among all the overseas uh, campuses. And uh, this, just for your information, uh, Monash is consistently ranked uh, in the top 100 universities uh, in the world by many different uh, ranking agencies. And in the Malaysia campus, uh, Malaysia campus, we have close to uh, now nine, about 9,000 uh, students and now close to uh, 900 uh, staff. And we have got seven schools uh, in the Malaysia campus, including uh, the School of uh, Medicine. Okay, so a brief introduction uh, of uh, NIPO and who we are and what we do. So we all know that uh, palm oil uh, is important uh, for global food security and energy security, but it has also been linked uh, to many controversies. And uh, Monash, Malaysia is operating in a region uh, where about 90% of the world's palm oil is produced. So I think it's important that uh, we play you know, our part to help uh, to address you know, some of the problems uh, facing the uh, industries. So Monash, uh, this uh, MIPO was established in 2018, uh, basically to help to promote the economic uh, industry linkages and uh, multidisciplinary uh, approach to improve the productions of uh, sustainable and healthy palm oil and palm-based uh, products. And these are our core activities. Basically, we, have, uh, we focus on uh, three different areas. So in research, uh, we have four uh, different uh, research clusters focusing on uh, environmental and social sustainability. Then we have got uh, food and health and waste wealth, palm oil processing and derivatives. And we also have uh, oil and fats uh, laboratory this is uh, we can provide you know, contract research and analytical uh, services uh, to the industries. And in education and uh, training, we support uh, some of the undergraduate courses related to uh, oil and fats uh, processing. And for your information, we'll be rolling out a master course on oil and fats uh, processing uh, starting March uh, next year. So if you're interested, uh, please let us know. Uh, and we also provide uh, PhD trainings uh, to our students. And in terms of engagement, we have been working with industries and we also have been organizing a number of activities 
uh, with uh, professional bodies like Mostar, uh, MPOB, ICAMI, and IKM. Okay, this slide shows the uh, academic staff who are working in the four research uh, clusters that uh, I've mentioned earlier. Uh, you can visit our website to know more about uh, our research activities and uh, capability. And these are some of the uh, processing equipment uh, in our lab. Uh, for example, we do have a pilot scale equipment to carry out reactions and uh, separations. And uh, we also have a continuous uh, molecular distillation uh, system. I think uh, probably uh, Brian, uh, uh, Brian is going to talk a bit more about uh, the molecular distillation sy system for the production of uh, uh, tocotrienol. Uh, and we do have like a high pressure homogenizer and spray dryer. And for oil and fats uh, analysis, we have GCMS, HPLC, GCFID, uh, Rancimat, ICP, total chlorine analyzer, auto titrators you know, that allow us to carry out the basic uh, oil and fats uh, analysis. So for more information, uh, please visit uh, our website or you can drop uh, me or Dr. Pushpa an email if you want to find out more about uh, what we do. So last uh, but not least, uh, once again, thank everyone for attend attending uh, this uh, webinar. So I hope everyone will have a fruitful uh, webinar. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks to Prof Chan for introducing Mipo to our participants. Now I will pass the floor to Dr. Yasoda to chair the speaker session. Now the floor is yours, Dr. Yasoda. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker for this afternoon. Dr. Li Yi Ying. Right? Dr. Li Yi Ying received her PhD degree in 2016 in food biotechnology and her BSc degree in 2010 in biotechnology from University Putra, Malaysia. She is currently a lecturer with the School of Science at Monash University, Malaysia. Her research interests revolve around the area of fats and oils technology focusing on improving the functional properties of edible fats and oils. She has received national and international professional awards for her PhD work, which was on the synthesis of structured lipid medium and long chain triacylglycerol, which includes the best PhD award from the Institute of Bioscience, University of Putra, Malaysia in 2016, and the Best Young Researcher Award from Asian Congress on Biotechnology in 2015. She was also an invited speaker for the International Palm Oil Congress, organized by the Malaysian Palm Oil Board. She has co-authored several book chapters and published 27 peer-reviewed articles. She is also the recipient of numerous research grant schemes supported by the Ministry of Education, Malaysia, and Monash University, Malaysia. Okay, Dr. Li, Dr. Li Yi Ying's talk for this afternoon is titled, Modification of Fats and Oils to Improve Its Functional Properties. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Li to give her talk to you. All right, um, thank you, um, Dr. Yashoda, for a very nice introduction. Thank you, um, Mipo for inviting me to give a talk on these um, topics and um, I'm going to um, um, present titles, um, topics entitled the modifications of fats and oils to improve its uh, functional property. Um, so um, I'm Ying, I'm from the um, School of Science, um, Monash University. So uh, just a brief introduction about the structures of fats and oils. So fats and oils basically are sometimes uh, it's known as um, triacylglycerols. Uh, it's basically a structure whereby it contains a glycerol backbone attached with uh, three fatty acids. And acid that attached to these glycerol backbones uh, comes from a diverse types of be it a short uh, saturated fatty acid, monounsaturated fatty acid with one double bond, polyunsaturated fatty acid. Uh, apart from the degree of unsaturation, the of fatty acid will also differ between one fatty acid to the other types of fatty acid. Um, as shown from the table of fatty acid, um, it's possible to attach to the 
glycerol backbones of the trials of glycerol. So we can see that from here, possibilities that we can have a diverse range of trials of glycerols because our vast variety of this um, fatty acid. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to share with you more on these um, trials species. And uh, this is just to show the trend global oil production um, in the world. So we can see that gradually the productions of fats and oil increases and it's done the palm oil and um, apart from soybean, ripseed, sunflower and also the other types of the oil. And um, so today I'm going to share a little bit on this, um, how we can actually modify um, the fats and oils, uh, basically to serve a few purposes, improve the oxidative stability, uh, which is meant um, primarily for the deep frying purposes. Or can also, we can also modify fats and oils to enhance their nutritional value, for example, with the incorporations of the omega-3 fatty acid. Um, so fats and oils can also form um, to get the desired fat trials of glucose species that we want, um, which means that we custom made the structures of the um, trials of glucose species, which I'm going to cover later on in much detail. And last but not least, what can also help us to change the physical characteristics of the oil as well. So these are the few um, common modifications techniques that structures of fats and oils, as simple as blending, um, hydrogenations, fractionation, transesterifications, and the latest with the oligenations. So um, basically a process where we can separate fats and oils, which are the trisoglycerol species, based on the melting point into two different fractions uh, known as the liquid fractions uh, and a so solid fraction, which is known as stirring under a control cooling manner. So in this case, what we can perform here is that we have our fats and oil. We will cool it down uh, under a cooling um, thermogram, a control cooling thermogram. So the hot fat will then crystallized, leaving behind the liquid or the soft. So here we can then separate the crystallized oil, crystallized oil from the liquid oil. So that is the fractionation process. And uh, the reason behind why we can separate is mainly because, uh, as what I've mentioned, that triacylglycerols, various range of fatty acid, be it saturated, unsaturated, um, long chain or a short chain, and even a medium chain fatty acid. So these are the uh, examples of the trials cholesterol molecule species of a types of as you can see that uh, the um, trials of cholesterol species, uh, we can have a variety of cholesterol species here because of the attachments of different types of fatty acid. Um, so we have our trisaturated, monounsaturated. We want um, um, fatty acid that is unsaturated, uh, diunsaturated with um, two um, unsaturated fatty acid, lick or lick, and this is palm lick. And also um, last one is triunsaturated fatty acid. All of these triunsaturated fatty acid, as we can see that they contained oleic acid. And um, if you can see from the table here that each of these species has a glycerols on melting point. So which is why we can separate them based on uh, according to this. Um, and um, apart from triacylglycerol species, if you can see from the picture here that each types of these triacylglycerol species, uh, they have um, crystals polymorphism, which is known as alpha beta prime and beta, which see how the, our fat crystals actually orient when uh, we pull it down. So each of these types of crystals of fat, they have their own melting point as well. So uh, we can see from here that the fat 
crystals polymorphism and also the triacylglycerol species uh, because of a difference, because it's melting point that is created by these two factors, we can then fractionate our oil into um, um, some um, stirring and also a liquid oil. So um, fractionations is used, we can use to basically to enrich a targeted TAG. For example, for the presence of coca butter alternative, we can um, fractionate uh, out the stirring fraction that is rich in these species of triacylglycerols that can be used as a coca butter alternative. We can use it to concentrate uh, phytonutrients, phytonutrients and chocolate which I'm going to cover later. And uh, latest one is uh, um, to study, we can also use fractionations um, to separate out the uh, MCPD and GE. And as lean fractions, uh, these processing contaminants tend to actually um, collect it at the old here. And um, our purpose of fractionation is it can also help to remove undesirables uh, minor components like waxes, diacylglycerols, and free fatty acids from the, the standards of the oil that we pick according to the PORAM standard. Um, so this is from a single oil. We can fractionate this palm oil into various fractions. Fraction, uh, we can use it for different and among all types of vegetable oil, palm oil or commonly fractionated oil, mainly because it contains 50% of saturated fatty acid that give this also 50% saturated fatty acid liquid uh, property. So which is why it is why it is mostly most commonly fractionated oil. So we can see from palm oil, we can fractionate into a hard stirring that can be used to produce venous party and um, a liquid uh, palm olin that is mainly used for frying oil. So the oil that you can see in the market um, that is used for cooking uh, is known as this uh, palm olin. And further to that, we can double frag the palm and produce various types of fractions that can be uh, incorporated into much butter equivalent as far as salad oil or a very cold state salad oil, even though we store it at refrigerated, so it, the oil will still remain liquid. And this is just the unique properties of the fractionated, particularly the mid fraction. As you can see that this mid fraction here, they are commonly used to produce coca butter um, alternative because um, this, um, this oil actually um, start uh, um, zero solid fat at around 35 Celsius, which means that it will completely melt when we put it inside our mouth. So it will not create the waxy feeling. So very sharp, straight away that from a solid fat, it can come. So that is uh, the properties of palmate fraction. So from fractionation, we can produce types of fractionated oil. The in um, actually use um, dry fractionations process to concentrate the tocopherols and tocotrienol from um, byproducts of the refining process, uh, known as the palm fatty acid distillate. So this is a byproduct that is distillated out during the authorization process, and it contains a high amount of um, these uh, phytonutrients. So we try to um, concentrate the phytonutrients from this palm fatty acid distillate. So what we do is that we try to study the fundamentals of dry fractionation condition. Um, for example, the um, crystallization temperature, the stirring speed, the cooling weight rate, and the holding times for the crystals to grow to see how actually that these phytonutrients can be concentrated in the olein fractions of the oil. And um, so these are the um, thermogram that we have. We, we look into the starting point or the temperatures where the oil started to crystallize. And it's found that 
the oil of a P, this uh, PFAD, it crystallizes at around 36 Celsius. And at this point, we can fractionate out the sterine and olein. But we further increase the temperatures to 44 because uh, in the real experiment, we noticed that crystallizations actually started at 44 Celsius. So that is the temperatures that we study. So we found that in our study that vitamin E, um, tocopherols and tocotrienol is um, ultimately higher in the olein fraction compared to the stirring fraction, which is very much correlated with a high degree of unsaturation. Um, so um, the, the, the lower the degrees of, uh, the lower the crystallization temperature, the higher the stirring speed and also the slow cooling rate basically uh, would produce uh, more concentrated tocopherols and tocotrienol in the olein fraction. And these are the crystals that we capture, uh, fat crystals that we capture using the polarized microscope. So you can see when we cool it down from 44 to 36, uh, crystals is very dense. So it means that crystals started to form, right? Uh, in uh, A lot of crystals started to form at very cold condition. And blending is another method of modifications. Uh, basically, it's just mixings of two or more different types of vegetables oils together. Uh, so uh, among all, all the types of modifications, this is considered the most economical way of modifying your oil because we only need a steel tank, a meter, an agitator, and, other, and also the heating devices to heat up our oil. Uh, in the presence or without, in the presence or absence of nitrogens to prevent oxidation of the oil. So, according to the study, that we can actually produce margarine, uh, trans fat free margarine, uh, by combining palm sterine, which is a hard stock, with um, soft oil, for example, Moringa olifera oil. This is just one example. It can be other types of soft oil as well. So, when we combine these two together, uh, we can have uh, create a plastic city effects to our oil, which means that our oil uh, can be spread out uh, relatively easily. It will not flow, it is not too hot. So this is also one of the way to produce a margarine. And we can also mix um, soft oil, like uh, macadamia oil, with um, like palm oil um, to increase the oxidative stability of your frying oil. Um, apart from that, um, certain specialty oil like coca butter also be produced through the blending of various types of vegetable oil together. And even for um, parenterals or enteros nutrition that is administrated to the patient, uh, it is produced through a blending process between the MCT and also the LCT. Um, and um, I think this is, should be the um, the uh, modifications of fats and oils, hydrogenations. Basically, we introduce hydrogens, gases, uh, during hydrogenation process in the presence of nickel catalyst to saturate out the double bond. So you can see that see, some of them they contain double bond. So with hydrogenations, we are trying to remove double bonds from there to produce saturated fat. So with hydrogenations, we are able to transfer a solid fat. So thereby, because of removals of this um, double bond, it will then increase oxidative stability of our oil. And this hydrogenated oil, they can be used as a hard stock uh, for the productions of various food applications like margarine or even like uh, um, this confectionery fat and, and as well as the uh, frying oil. But the disadvantages of hydrogenation is that if it is conducted incomplete, it will produce uh, trans fat uh, that is detrimental to our health. And um, in 2015, actually, that um, the, do have, um, the World Health Organization actually uh, does not recognize the partially hydrogenated oil to be considered as grass. So now that a lot of industry, they are trying to replace the partially hydrogenated oil that is used in their food products with other types of trans fat free uh, um, oil. 
So just to show you, I've also started to vent the partially hydrogenated oil in a bakery and snacks by um, 2021. And um, the other types of modern produce is transesterification. So transesterifications basically can be classified into three categories, uh, alcoholysis, acidolysis, and interesterifications reaction. Um, so what it means by here is that we have our triacylglycerols or fats, we react with alcohol, like glycerol, we can react with free fatty acid, uh, and, and also two different types of triacylglycerols. Go through the runner. So these are examples of transesterifications process, interesterification, uh, triacylglycerols. This is one example of triacylglycerols and another species of triacylglycerols, which I have labeled A and B. So when it goes through interesterifications, we can change the positions of uh, the fatty acids or uh, the types of fatty acid that attached to the glycerol backbone. So from here that uh, you can see that it changed, it changed into ABA configurations, right? From AAA. So this can be done by um, intensifying two different types of vegetable oil together. Acidolysis is with uh, a single triacylglycerol with fatty acid. So whatever fatty acid that would like to um, um, go through uh, ac acidolysis, you can basically use it. And acidifications is between glycerols and also free fatty acid. Uh, so these are various ways that we can produce specific types of TAG that we want. And most of the common, these methods is basically catalyzed by enzymes, all right, nowadays, because enzyme is small mild in reactions, they are very specific as well. Uh, they can act just very specific at position one and three here, to change the fatty acid, um, to, to, to incorporate the fatty acid that you want in your species. Uh, even though chemicals, we can use it, but chemicals, uh, there are several disadvantages as well. These, we need a lot of times to purify the products that we um, um, produce via chemical route. And uh, just to share with you the applications of um, in transesterifications process, uh, mainly they use to produce targeted TAG. Uh, you can customate, customize the structures of TAG there. For example, we can make um, coca bottle alternative triacylglycerols like POS, SOS, and POP with enzymes. So it's very pure. If, you, if you're able to produce, uh, control the conditions well, we can get a pure um, coca butter alternative with this structure. We can also um, milk fat, uh, human milk fat with these uh, configurations, OPO, olic, palmitic, and olid. So with enzymes, we can actually create this configuration. And this is also quite uh, in trend today that a lot of this uh, food industry also trying to look into the uh, productions of OPO. And other than that, that uh, with these um, interestrifications, we can produce um, anti-obesity oil like diacylglycerols oil and also medium and long chain triacylglycerols oil. So these oil uh, actually they are uh, already commercialized in Japan. Um, and to a very less extent that these interestrifications can also be used to produce a trans fat free uh, fat to be used in various application uh, because it does not involve hydrogenation. It just involves enzymes and you change the structures of the oil and we consider that as a trans fat fluid oil. And one of the interesting thing about uh, interesterification is that it produce, it can produce um, beta prime crystals in your fat. So these beta prime crystals is uh, desirable because uh, it gives a very um, soft textures to your margarine. Uh, without interestrifications, it's pretty difficult to get the better prime structures of the crystals of the fat. And in uh, our study, we actually produce we 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 produce uh, medium and long chain and long chain fat acid attached to the triacylglycerol backbone. So these are the six different configurations of MLCT. 
So we have medium chain and long chain there. So the purpose of having medium chain is it can be rapidly metabolized in our body uh, without uh, fat accumulation. And for long chain, it can serve to provide essential fatty acid to our body, right? So it can serve two purposes, act as anti-obesity effect, and also it can also provide at the same time essential fatty acid. So uh, what we have found is that we tried, we use the uh, palm canal oil that contain medium chain fatty acid and palm oil that contain long chain fatty acid. Uh, we interacidified them with an enzyme TLIM using this condition and it give around 60% of MLCT that we obtained. And we also verified in a 10 kg stir tank batch reactor and it give almost equivalent MLCT, MLCT around 58%. So this is the optimized conditions that we have determined. And uh, further to that, we analyzed the anti-obesity effect of this MLCT oil from palm. And it shows that um, this anti-obesity effect of palm is more uh, prevalent uh, when we consume in a low fat diet. And other than that, we also um, produce um, functional oil like medium chain trials, medium chain trials of glycerols, whereby the trials of glycerols contain all the medium chain fatty acid attached to it. So the reason behind why we want to create this is because it possesses anti-obesity effect. As um, I've mentioned that it can be rapidly metabolized in our body. So uh, what we are um, trying to do here is that we actually use esterification reactions between uh, C8 fatty acid and also glycerols to produce the MCT. And it has been shown that these are a few applications of MCT. Uh, it can act as parenteral nutrition. It can encapsulate lipophilic compound um, preventions in COVID-19 and act as the anti-obesity treatment. Um, so these are the few studies that we have actually looked into how to use enzymes to carry out esterification reactions between C8 and also glycerol. So um, I think um, I'm not going to go into that into details um, because of time constraint. Um, but, and the last modifications technique will be oligylations technique. The recent one that people are looking into to modify oil. Uh, basically in this oligylations, what we're trying to do is uh, we try to entrap the liquid vegetable oil uh, into a crystallized network using an organogelator, be it a low molecular weight organogelator or a high molecular weight organogelator. So these are examples of organogelator here. So basically this organogelator, it will create a three-dimensional um, um, network that can liquid oil. So it will then turn your liquid oil into a semi-solid oil. So it can be used to replace um, this um, 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 saturated hot stock. Uh, for various types of application. And it has been shown that this um, oil gel, because of the incorporations of organogelator, it can help also to control the lipid digestibility in our body. Um, so it can retard digestions of lipid. So it will lower down the total cholesterol and blood triglycerides level. But the main thing about challenging part about oligelation is that it's pretty difficult to get similar sensory attributes uh, like the originals uh, pets and oils. So um, in conclusion, so um, for pets and oils, we can modify it via various modifications approaches uh, to improve their functional properties, mainly aim to extend the application. Um, and, and nowadays that these modifications, they are moving towards the productions of specialty pets, uh, especially um, because of COVID-19, that confectionery products is in high demand and they are looking into alternative to get these hard stocks to produce the confectionery fat. And also fluctuations in coca butter, um, coca butter productions also um, is also also boost also um, um, boost up these uh, specialty fats uh, demand in the market. And apart from that, especially to fats markets can also be uh, catered towards the productions of healthier fat, like what I've mentioned, the anti-obesity um, fats, and also 
um, infant food lipids, the OPO as well. And last but not least, um, the modifications uh, fats and oils can also be, uh, which is low in fat, low in calorie, or zero in trans, which is what that uh, the industry are trying to look into nowadays, right? So, um, so thank you. So before I end my presentations, I would just like to acknowledge a few of these um, collaborators. So um, I would like to thank Monash University, particularly uh, MIPO, that support the research work that I have been doing in Monash, as well as School of Science as well. And also collaborators like Sam Dabi, um, which uh, provide a very supportive technical um, um, supports that uh, I need for my analysis as well. And also uh, my students uh, for their research work. Yeah, so uh, thank you everyone for attention. So um, that's all for my presentation. Right, Dr. Lee, thank you very much for your interesting talk on oils and fats. I would like to open the floor to the audience to ask Dr. Lee any questions regarding her talk. Anyone would like to ask Dr. Lee any questions? You're welcome to do so and she'll be glad to answer them. If you feel shy, you can type out the questions in the chat box and directly message it to her. Hello. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's me, Adil Hakam. Uh, I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, okay, so I'm interested with the slides, uh, which is the fractionation part. And then I find out that there is a, the one, uh, the one, the, the other purpose of the fractionation is to separate the NSPD and GE. Uh, which is uh, from all in, and then I just want to know how does it 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 can be done, and then what is the suitable analysis uh, to identify the NCPT and GE. All right. Um. Thank you, Adil. So um. So that um study on NCPT and GE using fractionations is a very recent study. I think so far, um, and so less people has been less study has been conducted using fractionations to separate them. Um, so, um, for MCPD and also GE, the most common um, um, analytical instruments that you need to analyze would be the um, GCMS. Yeah. And of course, if you want to check regarding the Olin and also the stirring fraction, um, um, GC, um, FID will be sufficient for you to look into the fatty acid compositions. Uh, to check the um, saturations of the oil in the olein and also the um, stirring fraction. Um, did I answer your question, um, Adil? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, I think it's okay. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lee, there's a question for you in the chat box. Okay, uh, Yen Li, you would like to know whether it would be possible to control the DAG in the oil and how do you remove it as well as uh, is there any way to segregate it? Okay, for DAG removal, um, DAG removals, you can use like um, shop path distillations. We can remove, separate out the DAG from the TAG. So I think that is the um, common methods that people are using. And, um, and also for the DAG oil that in Japan, that is sold in Japan, but right now it's banned because of the GE issue. So that high um, concentrations of DAG, they are also actually produced using um, enzymatic process and purify using shop path distillation. And I think that um, if you want to try to look into crystallizations also, uh, it, it can be possible as well. Uh, to look into uh, ways to fractionate out the DAG from the um, TAG. Um, yeah, um, Yen Li, yeah, that's my um, answer to your questions. Um, did, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question, Yen Li. All right, now, uh, Dr. Li, we have another question from Ban Kok Kok in the chat box. Could you please answer this question? Okay, so can you explain how does interesterified fats helps to reduce the uh, body weight? So has it been tested in um, human um, trial, All right? Um, so in 
So I think that you are looking into the um, functional oil that can be used to modulate um, obesity in our body. So that actually, so as what I've mentioned that um, these types of oil has been commercially sold in Japan uh, by cow and also by Nishin oil, all right? Uh, the um, the Reseta uh, MLCT oil. So um, it can be used to modulate obesity because if you look into the structures of MLCT, uh, particularly uh, MLM structure. Uh, so because of our body, our lipase in our body, they will digest at the positions of one and three. So if you have medium chain fatty acid attached to this one and three position, so fatty acid can be sent directly to livers to go through better oxidation process. So leaving behind the second positions, uh, that is fatty acid that is attached to glucerols. So this will be uh, sent it back to lymphatic systems to, um, to regenerate the new TAG. So you can see that at one and three positions, if we uh, incorporate with medium chain fatty acid, so it's less likely that this fatty acid can be recirculated back to our body um, to be accumulated, accumulated in uh, as fat. So that is also one of the ways uh, how interacerified oil can be used to modulate obesity. I think the other one is uh, in the form of diacylglucerol. So it has a different metabolisms that, uh, uh, that our body actually possess it, which is why it gives um, this anti-obesity effect. So it has, uh, human trial has been conducted for both types of the oil, uh, um, about this uh, anti-obesity effect of this M MLCT, the MCT, and also the DAG. Right. Okay. Since we're running short of time, uh, uh, for those of you who have uh, forwarded your questions through the chat box, Dr. Lee will answer your questions through the chat box. And now I would like to move on to the second speaker of today. All right, Dr. Lee, would you mind right, answering thanks. the question? All right, yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. All right, okay, thanks a lot, yeah, Dr. Lee. Yeah, thanks. All right, okay. Uh, our second speaker for this afternoon is Mr. Brian C. Okay, Mr. Brian C. graduated from University Science Malaysia with a BSc honors degree in food technology back in 2004. He has more than 15 years of experience in operations, new product development, clinical research, regulation, sales and marketing, and business development in nutrition and phytonutrition, phytonutrients, both in the consumers and manufacturers market. He's also equipped with extensive experience in promoting harm phytonutrients, in particular tocotrienols and carotenoids, as well as palm phytonutrient products to various industries such as pharma industries, dietary supplement, F&B, animal feeds and personal care, and cosmetic products, okay? Mr. Brian C. has also demonstrated the ability to enhance company and product brands via research and marketing. He's also experienced in obtaining grants and engaging researchers, government officers, and NGOs to carry out research and activities related to palm phytonutrients and sustainability. Prior to working in Excel White, which was previously known as Carotech, Mr. Brian C was the operations executive at GNC Malaysia. Okay, now I would like to invite Mr. Brian C to give his talk on the potential of palm oil phyto phytonutrients in nutraceutical and health foods. Mr. Brian C, go ahead. Okay, thank here. you, thank you, thank you. Thanks for the kind uh, introduction. That is uh, a very uh, kind uh, introduction uh, for me. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian C. Uh, I'm the uh, VP uh, for uh, Phyto Gaia, particularly in uh, business development and uh, technical support. So thank you for the opportunity allowing me to share my, uh, I would say, uh, my experience in uh, palm phytonutrients. Okay, and today my topic is about, you know, the potential of palm phytonutrients in both dietary supplements and health food industry. 
So, uh, yeah, a little bit about myself. Okay, uh, I graduated from uh, USM, Penang, Malaysia, as a food technologist. And uh, I'm an extrovert. I can't, you know, work at the uh, factory. So I decided to take up a, a position at GNC, you know, uh, when I started my the journey, you know, in, 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 in 2004. Uh, and then after that, I moved back to Ipoh. I joined Carotech and then stroke Excel White for about 15 years. So for the past 15 years, I have two things to do, you know, to uh, promote either palm phytonutrients or the palm, sorry, palm topotrienols or the palm carotene. And it's like, you know, promoting a, uh, a smartphone. Yeah. So we need science and technologies to drive these two new products. Yeah. It, because there's a new product to the American, especially to, uh, you know, the Western country, no one knows about tocotrienol, and they have been using beta carotene synthetics. So we need those, you know, technologies and science to uh, drive the product, just like how the smartphone company, Huawei, Apple, um, Samsung, you know, promote the product without R&D, without science. Don't tell them you have a new, uh, don't tell them the gadget is the same. You want to sell them an extra price or you know, sell the products to them. So it's challenging. So, so I've been working with a researcher you know, at Monash University. I work closely with Prof. Kalib Kadil, Prof. Amu, you know, um, in doing research related to uh, tocotrienols and uh, you know, using those information, promote uh, both uh, tocotrienol and carotene to, uh, to, uh, to uh, various countries and uh, use, use those clinical data as a safety reports. Of course, we need to do uh, toxicology studies as well to do registration. So I've uh, been doing that for the past 15 years and uh, able to uh, market these two uh, palm tocotrienol and carotene to overseas um, to many, many uh, dietary supplement and cosmetic companies such as Shishedo, SD Lodos, Amway, you know, New Skin, GNC, you name it. Those are the big, big brands. So we do supply to, uh, you know, different uh, brands and uh, dietary supplement companies. So, uh, so let's talk about the global uh, dietary supplement market for, uh, you know, now. So in 2019, according to facts and factors, the uh, global market for uh, dietary supplement is about 168 billion. Yeah, 168 billion. Um, Amway alone, I think they are making about 10 billion a year. Okay, just Amway alone, 10 billion a year. Okay. Uh, by 2026. You know, it will touch, it will get more than 300 billion, yeah? And uh, an annual the CAGR of 9%, okay? For cosmetic and personal care market, it's much la larger. It's about 442 billion US dollar uh, as per 2000, uh, 2020. You know, so for uh, by 2026, it will reach uh, 558 billion. So if you add up both, um, you know, the dietary supplement market, 168 and then uh, 442 billion, that is about 600 billion market for both dietary supplements and cosmetics. So say for example, you know, the palm phytonutrients can get about, you know, 0.01%, which is 100 part per million, okay, 0.01%. So 600 billion is about... Uh, how many? Me, 600 million or 60 million? 60 million? Okay. So 60 million uh, dollars, yeah. So so that is a huge market, you know, for, for palm phytonutrients, yeah, 60 million dollars uh, market. Okay. So uh so what we can what can we expect from palm, you know, in terms of the uh, minor uh, phytonutrients or the uh, palm phytonutrients. So we, I put it into two groups, the lipids, soluble nutrients, and the water, soluble nutrients. So, uh, and the uh, lipid, soluble nutrients, mainly extracted from the Maxocap or the crude palm oil. Okay, the first one is the uh, tocotrienols or stroke tocopherol, about 600 to 1 
thousand part per million depending on the uh, the species that you get you get it from orifera you know the uh, the uh, the level would be uh, higher compared to uh, the uh, the luna salinas sorry the uh, elias quinesis okay uh, then the carotenoids is about 500 to 700 part per million steroids 330 to uh, 530 part per million the la and then another interesting compound is the squalene, uh, the plant squalene, about 200 to 500 part per million. Okay. So the, what, the water soluble nutrient is the uh, oil palm leaf extract, the poly, uh, and then the uh, oil palm uh, phenolics from the uh, palma. Okay. So the, uh, obviously, the oil palm leaf extract is extracted from the front of the leaf. The uh, oil palm leaf phenolic. Phenolic is extracted from a byproduct, you know, from the uh, the uh, CPO process called a poma. Okay, and then the so the next slide is about you know the uh, the uh, the uh, clinical study that you can find on PubMed. Uh, interestingly, there is one uh, or just one. There is one uh, randomized control double blinded uh, trial published in 2013 related to brain and cognitive health on the uh, oil palm leaf extract. And the result is interesting. So, but unfortunately, there isn't any product, commercial product uh, in the market right now. Yeah, and I, 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 I did a search, you know, if you do a Google search, there are two companies or, or, or two entity owns the uh, patent right now. One is UPM, another is uh, Pahang Pharmacies, yeah. So they have a IP about the uh, the oil palm leaf extract, either the composition or the extracting uh, process. So 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 these two are the pattern that they hold. But I'm sure there are ways that you can get through and then find a way to make the uh, oil palm leaf, and then you know um 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 do some study and market the products. So those are the opportunity can be done on the oil palm leaf extract and you know you have a, a, a study you know as a uh, example you know published in 2013 that you know uh, shows beneficial result um, in relation to uh, cognitive health the second product that you know uh, I did you know uh, I searched on uh, PubMed is the uh, oil palm phenolics there's one randomized control uh, trial published in uh, 2018 by Professor, sorry, by Dr. Sundram and uh, his, uh, his team, um, you know, uh, more on uh, safety, okay, published in uh, 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 PMC. So more on safety. And at the moment, they have launched a few products uh, in, uh, in America. Okay, the challenges that they face, why only a few products? Okay, the uh, MPOB owned the license, the patent, and the license to a Mexican company um, called uh, Finolis. Okay, and they launch products, uh, run the production in Mexico, and then commercialize the product in America. At the moment, they uh, face a lot of challenges to promote the products. Uh, because the uh, safety, uh, sorry, the registration status, there are only two countries approved the, uh, the product at the moment, which is America and Canada. So, so uh, it limited the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the market, okay? And, you know, the, the, the country that they can market the product and uh, uh, not much of a clinical study to substantiate the ingredients. So, so those are the challenges for, uh, for oil palm uh, phenolics, yeah, extracted from pome. Okay, uh, of course, tocotrana and tocopherols, uh, we have more than uh, uh, 27 uh, randomized controlled uh, trial uh, since the uh, 90s. Uh, you know, Monash have published, uh, I think, more than five uh, human clinical study related to uh, tocotrienols in diabetic complications, uh, Prof. Amu is doing the studies related to immunity, um, and they are studied by the USM, you know, in relation to uh, white matter lesion, uh, liver health. Um, you know, Prof. Yuen Kahe have done the bioavailability in the uh, late 90s, 
early uh, 20s, Hobby developed the first um, self-emulsifying delivery system for uh, tocotrienol. They call it Tocovid SuperBio. And a lot of uh, toxicology study safety uh, data have been uh, generated. So, so this product is, is, is uh, well accepted throughout the world, except I think uh, at the moment is Korea and uh, China. Okay. Uh, it's grass approved by US FDA, uh, approved by EPSAT in, uh, in, in Europe, you know, uh, Malaysia as well, Southeast Asia. So, so uh, you can see uh, many products on, uh, you know, uh, using uh, tocotrienol launch in the market. Uh, there are about six producing uh, companies, uh, six companies in Malaysia producing tocotrienol for the time being. Okay. So, uh, so you can see, you know, when you have science, safety data, clinical trial, it actually drives an ingredient. So, so research, you know, are important for, for, for dietary supplements and cosmetics ingredients. The second product, uh, I mean, the second fat soluble uh, phytonutrient is the palm carotene, 500 to 700 parts per million. Uh, 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 there are about 16 uh, randomized uh, control uh, trial published. I mean, you can find on PubMed, okay, mainly related to uh, cardiovascular, vitamin A activity, and skin health. This, these are the three areas. A potential areas that I would see is uh, eye health, okay, especially, you know, when we are entering 6G, 7G, we'll have We'll need to spend more time, you know, on screen, monitor tablets, not just ourselves, our kids, you know, our parents will have to spend more time our ent entertainments on, uh, you know, uh, on, on screen monitors, tablets. So I help would be an interesting um, uh, area. And, and we know carotenes, you know, vitamin A uh, are important for uh, night vision, eye, eye health. So that will be an interesting area. Beside that, um, you know, I'm not going to touch on vitamin A. You can get synthetic vitamin A. So, so to use the uh, expensive uh, palm carotene as a vitamin A replacement, that will be a bit challenging. Okay. Another application for, uh, for, for, for the uh, palm carotene is uh, colors. You know, carotenoids is a pigment from yellows to orange or even red because of the lycopene. So, but the palm carotene is from between yellow and uh, orange. So it can be used as a colors for uh, margarine, butter, and it, it can be emulsified or make into powders, you know, to be used in a uh, water soluble uh, food or beverage as a coloring agents. Yeah. So it's a proof, you know, uh, in throughout the world. I haven't come across any country that doesn't allow palm carotenes. It has an E numbers, it's grass approved, you know, it's approved in China as well. So um, widely used in, uh, in food products. Okay, the third is the, uh, the third fat soluble compound is the uh, palm phytosterols. Um, you know, there's no human clinical study at the moment uh, related to palm phytosterols. And you know, not I. I think there are not many pro producers um, on palm phytosterols at the moment. Uh, even there is, you know, they don't refine it because the cost is too expensive. And uh, another reason is the soy-based uh, phytosterols is much much uh, cheaper. Yeah, it's more economical because they are high level of the uh, phytosterol from soy. Yeah, so the, the cost of production of the uh, soy-based phytosterol is much lower compared to the palm. So, so uh, that's why there are not many companies making the uh, palm phytosterols, okay? And they're not even the studies on palm phytosterols, yeah? So the uh, fourth lipid-soluble uh, phytonutrients that, uh, you know, important in the uh, crude palm oil is the squalene, yeah? Uh, palm squalene about 200 uh, to 500 parts per million. Again, you know, no studies uh, at the moment. You cannot find any on PubMed, no studies at the moment. Um, and uh, I don't think there is a company producing squalene in Malaysia for the time being, uh, as far as I know, okay? 
uh, but is a uh, important compound in the uh, in the fruit palm oil. So I'll just make a summary, give, give an overall uh, view. You know, unfortunately, I'm not a, uh, I don't have an engineer background. I'm not a researcher. I'm just trying to give you an overview on the uh, palm phytonutrients. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, I'll, throw you, I'll throw some questions to you guys so that um, you guys can give it a thought or ask me a questions you know, uh, from, uh, from here. So, so we know there are about six compound yeah phytonutrients from palm yeah either from the crude palm oil or from the uh, uh, you know the water soluble nutrients but the question is always what is next you know there are people who have done the work uh, so 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 what can be done okay for example like the tocotrienols and the carotene these are the two compound you know extracted since you know carotec time uh, 25 years 26 years ago since uh, mid 90s so, and study has been done, uh, safety has been done. Uh, so it's a matured areas. So, so what can be done next? You know, so I'm like, I'm, but I mentioned for carotenoids, vitamin A activity, many study has been done and to replace, you know, uh, the synthetics or, you know, the, the retinols with the palm carotene is a bit, uh, is a bit uh, challenging because of the price. So, so what is next? I think the next would be the uh, biological advantages of the palm carotenes. So one one of it is the uh, is the uh, is the uh, you know the eye the vision. Okay. Another interesting area is uh, the metabolism, uh, the uh, obesity weight management. There is a study published in two thousand seventeen that shows multi carotenoids together with palm. You know is able to regulate. Uh, you know, uh, manage the uh, weight of the in, in kids. So for tocotrienols, obviously, you know, is a matured areas. Uh, there are many researchers has is uh, are doing the, the the clinical work. So uh, what can be done next? You know, you guys can think about it and then you know ask ask through uh, you know ask question. And then the uh, next area is the uh, oil palm leaf extract. Of course, extraction method, it will be challenging. And our Prof Chan and the team may want to look into that. Uh, uh, oh, I forgot, you know, about tocotrienol. Uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Lee, you know, I have question to you, to you as well, when you do the crystallization uh, on the uh, palm fatty acid distillate. Beside tocotrienol, what other phytonutrients you can see from the extract? Yeah, you know, do you see other valuable uh, uh, phytonutrients like phospholipids and so on? Yeah, so so on the oil palm leaf extract, you know, it's definitely interesting um, because the, the 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 compound shows uh, cognitive uh, beneficial activity. Yeah, so 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 but. There's no commercial products. I don't think there is a commercial production even. You know, I don't think there is even there is even a commercial production. So, 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 uh, but clinical studies have shown the uh, cognitive health activity, and then the oil palm phenolics. You know, uh, is work in progress. They need time. I think uh, they need a lot of efforts, money, time to uh, to uh, to bring up the products. The other two uh, ingredient that is yet uh, developed, you know, uh, or launched commercially launched in the market is the phytosterols. You know, sterol would be a bit challenging because of the uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, uh, soy based uh, phytosterols, and then another would be the squalene. Uh, personally, I think uh, squalene is a uh, unpolished jewel, unpolished jewel because. You know, uh, if, as you may know, squalene is from the shark liver, especially the deep sea shark liver. Okay, and it's an endangered uh, uh, animal. Okay, uh, another alternative is from the oil. Oh, oh sorry, the olive uh, oil. Olive oil. You know, they do have high levels of the uh, squalene. Uh, however, the uh, olive oil squalene is not stable. So they have to make it into squalane. Uh, you have to change the word from uh, E to A. Yeah. 
So they hydrogenate the uh, squalene into squalane. Uh, so you know the squalene has six double bond. They hydrogenate it and make it into uh, hundred uh, 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 from isoprenoid, making it to a saturated uh, compound. So of course the uh, potency would be reduced compared to uh, the squalene. Uh, however, it's more stable compared to squalene. So I do not know whether the palm base is stable, but it will be interesting to uh, look into it. Yeah, if it's stable, it'll, you do not need to hydrogenate, then you can replace the shark liver uh, squalene. So that will be interesting. Um, so that would be my uh, overview uh, on the uh, palm phytonutrients. So a little bit about the uh, phytogaia. Phytogaia is a young company. We have a uh, team of uh, employee that with uh, high passionate uh, and commitment in uh, using science and technologies to, uh, to uh, promote natural uh, ingredient to uh, uh, help food dietary supplement market. Okay, that is what we, 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 we wanted to uh, do, okay? And uh, uh, our vision is to uh, turn Malaysia or even the tropical country into a Silicon Valley of the biotech. Yeah, not just on palm. You know, I've been doing palm for 15 years, but if you look into Malaysia, we have so many natural resources or tropical countries. So another you know, vision that we have is to turn this area into a, uh, a Silicon Valley of the, for, for biotech or nutraceutical. So we strive to achieve our mission with share values, you know, like um, share with value and vision, synergism, um, profession, professionalism, innovative solution, creative, passion, proactive, mutual uh, benefits. Yeah. So oops, uh, for some reason, uh, so, you know, we are not perfect. We are always looking for partners to, uh, to work together you know, to uh, achieve, uh, you know, the, the goal or vision that we share, okay? So that's uh, ends my the presentation. If you guys have any question, welcome to uh, send me, uh, send the question to me, or you can, if you can ask question. Okay, thanks, Mr. Brian, for your interesting talk. Now I would like to invite the audience Forward your questions to Mr. Brian C, and I'm sure he'll be glad to answer them. Okay. Those of you who are shy, you can type out your questions through the chat box. Um, hi, um, thank you, Mr. Brian, for an interesting insight on the palm phytonutrients. Okay. So, um, my question is actually quite technical, yeah. particularly on the tocotrienol isomers. Mm -hmm. So I would just like to uh, know if you could comment, based on your experience and knowledge, uh, which of the tocotrienol isomers uh, are seen to be the most sensitive or easy to degrade uh, due to external stresses, such as oxygen and temperature, mainly due to processing or storage? I mean, uh, that is a good question, uh, you know, uh, based on my, uh, okay, there are two, two, two areas that you, we, um, I look at that uh, one is the uh, biological activity, one is the uh, chemical uh, reaction, right? When you do the uh, process, it's more on the uh, chemical reaction. And then you have the in vitro study where you see, you know, uh, which compound will uh, sacrifice and how to, to do that biological activity. So two, 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 two different uh, um, area. So yours is more into the chemical uh, reaction. What I have seen is the uh, delta and the uh, gamma would sacrifice themselves or would get degraded much faster than the alpha. And uh, because the beta tocotrienol amount is not that much, so I'll, 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 I'll exclude that. But the uh, uh, gamma and delta, okay, will uh, degrade much faster compared to uh, to uh, alpha uh, tocotrienols. When you have those kind of uh, heat, you know, a pH uh, kind of challenge. Right. Uh, thank you so much for the answer. You have rightly put it, but uh, could you elaborate a bit more on why would that happen? Because I, I understand it's because of the structural characteristics, but isn't alpha is highly methylated and it should be the first one to be sensitive to uh, oxygen because it is highly active in the biological. Yes. Yes. Agreed. It's 
is highly, you know, so that, that is an interesting question. But, but uh, when it comes to biological activity, biological activity, it involves so many, in, involves so many um, uh, steps, I would say steps, uh, like, you know, the bioavailability, okay? So when, 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 when you, okay, say for example, uh, you have the uh, gamma, alpha, and delta, okay? You give the same amount of alpha, gamma, and delta, tocotrienol to a uh, subject. After supplementation, the alpha tocotrienol uh, level is the highest because the, absor the uh, absolute absorption rate is 27.7%, okay? The delta and gamma tocotrienol, the absolute absorption rate is only less than 10%, okay? So even though you give 100 milligrams of each to a subject, you know, in the plasma, you can find 27, about 27% of the delta, the gamma and, and delta itself, you know, just because of the absorption, you only get 10 or less, right? So, so it may not be because of the uh, biological activity, just because of the absorption, the, 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 the compound is much lower, okay? Then it, it have so many, um, you know, uh, 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 and, and also the, when it comes to, uh, uh, biological activities, okay? Uh, when we did the uh, human tissue distribution study, okay? Uh, we observe high level of gamma, you know, in the liver, okay? Uh, compared, to, uh, compared to other uh, areas. And, uh, and uh, based on uh, my own, my own uh, studies, you know, my own works, uh, I can put them into a few groups in terms of uh, immunity, okay? Uh, alpha, if I'm correct, Prof. Amu can correct me. Alpha, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, one of the studies shows alpha is the best. In terms of cardiovascular activity, gamma, okay? In terms of uh, uh, anti-cancer activity, um, delta, delta to quadrinal is the best. So, so, so I think it all comes to, you know, the, uh, the challenge that you, 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 I mean, the challenge that they have, you know, when, when it comes to the individual uh, tocotrienol activity. Yeah. So, but in terms of the, uh, temperature pH and so on, the tocotrienol, uh, gamma and delta will degrade much faster compared to, uh, alpha to porphyro, uh, alpha tocotrienols. Did I answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you so much uh, for your uh, observation and what you have uh, put it here. And if you don't mind, I have one last question. Yeah. So since I'm sure that you cater for a lot of uh, different products type, which can be powder, uh, liquids and stuff like that. Yeah. So uh, is there any study or based on, is there like a trend in uh, does the system that the tocotrienol is in? Uh -huh affects the extent of degradation of the isomers. So example, maybe in emulsion solvent, a specific toco isomers are more prone to degradation than in powder form, in dry form. Okay, let, let me put it this way. Um, would that would have to, you have different form is to cater different application. You have to, is to cater different application. Not, not for, you know, not much on the stability, not much on the stability. Of course, stability would, would give an advantage to the uh, the form, yeah, the delivery system of the uh, of an ingredients, yeah. But what right. if I make for an ingredient, uh, make for a form or delivery system, the objective is to fit the application. Say for example, tablets, right? You eat tablets. You need to make sure the the the, the tocotrienol is in a uh, very strong coating where it can stand direct compression, uh, direct compression, and make it. Uh, make it into a tablet, right? So that is that is the uh, that is the purpose when you want to when you make the tocotrano into bitlets. Okay, the powder you have to ensure you know the uh, it is stable, it is water dispersible, it is stable in 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 different pH. Of course, there is no one powder that suitable for high high I mean the uh, high pH and low pH. No. You know, so you have to develop two powders. One is stable in the alkaline system. One is stable in the acid system. Okay. If you can find, you can do. If you can make a product, you know, uh, a powder 
that's suitable for alkaline and uh, acid uh, system metrics, that would be great. But uh, that would be very, based on my experience, that would be challenging, right? So an emulsion, the same, you know, uh, you make an emulsion that is stable in the uh, aqua system, you know, pH uh, 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 seven acid or, or alkaline. So that is the, uh, the uh, objective. So when you, when you meet that objective, then the next step is how to extend its stability, how to extend its shelf life. Yeah, so it's always come with a priority. So the priority, whether you know that system is suitable for that application, then how, once that is done, look into its stability. Not, not because you make, a, make, make stability and then get a product. I don't think that is the right approach, yeah? Chara. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you so much uh, for your time and explanation and yeah. the insightful sharing. Thank you. Uh, hi, Mr. Brian. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your insightful presentation. I wish to extend uh, the question raised by Charanjit earlier. Yeah. Yeah. So between, uh, because in Palm, we know there's not only the tocotrienols, but also tocopherols, yeah. but it's the alpha tocopherol. So do you know like between alpha tocopherol and alpha tocotrienol, which among them should actually degrade faster if exposed to pH and heat as well. Yeah. Uh, you have alpha. any idea on that? Yeah, yeah. We did a study with the UPM. Um, you, alpha to corporal is much stable. Alpha to corporal is stable. Yeah. Even though I don't, don't like it, you know, but uh, alpha to corporal is stable. Yeah. I see. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brian. Anytime. Okay, all right, everyone, uh, we're running out of time. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Lee and Mr. Brian C. once again for, uh, uh, for <clears throat> sorry, uh, once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Lee and Mr. Brian C. for agreeing to give a talk for this uh, particular webinar series. And for those of you who have any additional questions that you would like Dr. Lee or Dr. Mr. Brian C. to answer you could you can directly email them your questions and for those of you who have any questions regarding MIPO the work conducted here the research conducted by MIPO staff you can forward your questions directly to either our director Prof Chan or deputy director Dr Pushpa and thank you once again everyone for attending our webinar series for today All right Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.